Uh, now I'll go ahead and invite uh, President. Is it President or General? It's General, Madam. <laughs> General Washington up to um, speak with us. Well, good evening, which is a proper colonial greeting. By way of introduction, formally, my name is George Washington. My rank is Commanding General of the Continental Forces of these United States. Though, yes, my serial number is one. <laughs> Of course, we did not have serial numbers, but I was the first officer commissioned to build an army where none existed to fight the most powerful military force in the known world, the British Army. I have come some 2,000 miles from my beloved Mount Vernon in 200 years of history to remind a forgetful people of the legacy of faith and freedom that has been left to you. We are a forgetful nation. We have forgotten from which we have come. There was a man that said that a people without a heritage are easily manipulated. His name was Karl Marx. In California, I understand that they are considering removing American history as a curriculum in the school system to make more time for taking tests. A people without a heritage are easily manipulated. We must remember this. Uh, Lady Edith has updated me on some very fascinating things. Uh, I would like to say I'm very proud of what you've done with the place, Americans, but that would not be true. I appreciate what you all have put forth as far as an effort to turn this nation back to those fundamental principles. One of the things Lady Edith has made me aware of is some odd habits that you have. And one of those is called regifting. <laughs> Quite fascinating. If I understand correctly, if you get a gift and you already have one or you don't like the color or etc., then you rewrap the gift and give it again. Well, I would like to practice, if I could, Lady Edith, I would like to practice some regifting. And the first thing I would like to regift is this document. It's called the Declaration of Independence, I believe is what you call it. But there's some fascinating things in this document that make you unique among the nations of the world. You understand that in its preamble, it says that all men are created equal. Now this is something you have grown accustomed to hearing, but at the time this was written, that was not considered even a possibility. The monarchy was nearly deity, and royalty was below that, and the peasantry was nearly chattel to be manipulated. Unfortunately, I think we're going back to that system if we're not careful. But in the beginning, it said that all men are created equal. Very unique concept. Makes you very unique among the nations of the world. And then it says that you're given unalienable or inalienable rights. The rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And those rights are given by the laws of nature and nature's God. Now many today say that these terms do not speak of the God of the Bible or those fundamental principles. But if you go back and read Blackstone, who wrote the commentary on which all of the founding fathers cut their legal teeth, Blackstone said that the law of nature is that which God instills in man for self-preservation. And he goes on in greater detail, but that's the gist of what he said. And then, of course, in this document, we stated all of our grievances with the crown of England. But about two-thirds down, it says, We no longer appeal to the crown of England, but to the great judge of the world, to weigh our cause, and if he finds it just, to bless it. And then at the end of this document, it says, We rely on divine providence. And we committed our lives our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The hand of providence. What does that term mean? Have you ever considered that? Do your children and your grandchildren know what that term means? It simply means the hand of God. Read the writings of the Founding Fathers. We said that the hand of providence protected us, guided us. The hand of God. Your children should know what that means. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this document in the beginning and in the middle, 
And at the very end, who did it recognize? God. You call this the Declaration of Independence. You could have just as easily called this document the Declaration of Dependence because that's what it acknowledged. We need to go back to those principles if we're going to have the freedoms for the next generation. Lady Edith also made me aware of another odd habit you have. You, you name generations. I believe most of you are, are called bombers. Is that the right term? Bombers? B uh, yes, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Boomers. <laughs> most of you are boomers. And then after your generation is the Y generation and the X generation. But I read in a periodical just the other day, do you know what they're calling the next generation after those? The ones that, at, they're, that, that are at your knee today? They're calling them Generation Zero. Zero. Generation Zero. For the first time in American history, we are leaving the country in worse shape than it was presented to you. We're leaving them bankrupt socially, economically, academically, spiritually, spiritually. My challenge to you tonight is change the name of that generation to the blessed generation. It doesn't take a majority. Samuel Adams said it doesn't take a majority, but a on fire minority keen on setting fires in the minds of men. Do you realize when we signed this document, about a third of the nation was committed to the crown of England. And another third was committed to the patriot cause. And, and of course, there was a third in the middle that did not want to commit until they saw who came out on top. <clears throat> but do you realize that it was less than 2%, less than 2% of the population of this nation that stood with me and fought for the freedoms that you have? My army was never more than 26,000 when the population was 4 million. Consider that. Less than 2% gave you the freedoms that you have today. It doesn't take a majority, but an on-fire minority. And I believe I'm speaking to the choir tonight in, in that avenue. But I would like to remind you that freedom is not free. In fact, Lady Edith said that I mentioned that a, a note was written by John Adams to a very special group of people. He called them posterity. There's another lost concept in America. Posterity simply means those not yet born. Read the writings of the Founding Fathers. We had a vision for posterity. For those not yet born, that is you. We had a 200-year plan for this nation. That's about to play out. We were the founding fathers. We need sustaining fathers and mothers if this nation is going to continue in freedom like it has. What is your vision for your posterity? What are you willing to sacrifice for those not yet born? Lost concept. Can I share with you, this is a piece of paper and it has some very interesting signatures to most of you their signatures with some history. But to me, these were real men. Could I share just a few stories? John Hancock, of course, the largest signature, he said that he signed it large so that the king could read it without his spectacles. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, as he signed, he said, gentlemen, we must hang together, or most assuredly, we will hang separately. Many of you heard that story. Abraham Clark, have you ever heard of Abraham Clark? As Abraham Clark began to sign this document, by those that were in witness, it, it was reported that the quill in his hand began to quiver. And the more he tried to hold it steady, the more it quivered. You could see the muscles working in his jaws. He tried to hold it still. Finally, as his face flushed red, and he gave up. He said, gentlemen, my hand may quiver, but my heart is steady. And he signed this document. Caesar Rodney signed this document. Caesar Rodney, right after the beginning of the Revolutionary War, 
He developed a, a canker on the side of his nose. I believe today you would call it skin cancer. His two treating physicians implored Caesar Rodney to immediately denounce signing this document so he could go back to England and acquire or obtain the only successful treatment. He refused. Over the eight years of the war, as his family and friends watched, that canker slowly, grotesquely consumed his face until at the end of the war it had consumed his life. But he would not denounce signing this. John Hart. John Hart and his wife Elizabeth had 13 beautiful children. Martha and I spent many an evening at their beautiful plantation. Their children could play every instrument you can imagine and sing into the wee hours of the morning. It was amazing. John Hart's neighbors were loyal to the crown of England. So throughout the war, he could not return to his home. He actually lived in a cave deep in the depths of the forest, miles from his home, hiding from the British. They would ferry him supplies and news as how our glorious cause was going. And during that time, they reached him with an urgent message that his wife, Elizabeth, was gravely ill. So risking his own life, he snuck back to his own plantation home. And it's recorded that he had 22 precious minutes with his wife Elizabeth before his neighbors had reported him. And as he fled through his own garden as the British fired on him, back to his cave. At the end of the war, as John Hart returned to his plantation to find it completely burned out, everything he owned gone, a fresh grave at that foundation of his wife Elizabeth who had died alone. Of his 13 children, we searched for months. We petitioned. It was never discovered what the British had done with his family. Two months after we won independence, John Hart died of a broken heart. Freedom is not free. John Adams wrote that note. It said, Posterity, you will never know what it cost my generation for your generation to have the freedoms that you have. You remember Abraham Clark? Most of you don't even know his name, honestly. Abraham Clark had two fine strapping boys. I made them officers in my old regiment, the Virginia 7th. They were captured. When it was discovered who they were, who their father was, they were sent to a prison ship in Manhattan and in the harbor of New York. Except this ship, it was called the Jersey. It was the rotting hole of a ship but the men did not call it the Jersey. It was actually called the hell ship. It was a rotting hulk. It had every vermin and pestilence and disease you can imagine. It is estimated that throughout the eight years of the war, 11,000 POWs lost their lives that went to the Jersey. So the greatest losses of the war took place on the hell ship. That's where Abraham Clark's two sons were sent. When it was discovered who their father was, the oldest son, Captain Clark, was put in solitary confinement, put in a hole, and they were going to starve him to death. They refused him food. When it was discovered by Congress what was happening to Captain Clark, Congress wrote to me and said, find the highest ranking British POW we have and starve him to death. I wrote to my counterpart on the Jersey, explained the situation, what can we do? And immediately, Captain Clark was put back in the general population and his life was spared. But the miracle of Captain Clark, he had been in that hole without food for three weeks. That's impossible, right? What was later discovered, the other prisoners would take a small portion of their bread ration and compress it, risking their own lives. If they had been caught, they would have been executed and pushing it through the keyhole, sustaining his life. Now, during that time, there was a knock on Abraham Clark's door. Can you imagine? There were two diplomats from the British government. And they handed him a piece of parchment, and on that parchment was a full pardon for Abraham Clark and his two sons. 
monetary compensation and passage to anywhere in the world. The British owned the seas. They owned the world. They could send Abraham Clark and his family wealthy for the rest of their life anywhere he wanted to go if he would do just one thing. And that's denounced signing this document. It's reported by, by those that were in witness that as Abraham Clark read that parchment, that that hand began to tremble again. And his tears began to fall. And he mumbled something. And excitedly, the British diplomats thought he had agreed to sign. Finally, one of these 56 men, finally one of them would denounce signing this document. And they said, excuse me, Mr. Clark. And it's described by those that were of witness that almost like a caged animal. Abraham Clark said, I cannot, I cannot. And he crushed it and handed it back and closed the door. Thinking he'd closed the door on the life of his two sons. Why would he do that? For posterity. For you. Holy Scripture says that if a father will train up a child in the way he should go, that when he is old, he will not depart from it. They say that I'm the father of a nation. Sons and daughters, I challenge you, I ask you, have you stayed in the way that you should go or have you departed from it? Change the name of that generation from generation zero to the blessed generation. I'd like to share one more story. Do we have time for one more story? I believe we're about to celebrate Thanksgiving in this nation. Of course, the first Thanksgiving, as reported by some, took place in 1621 by the separatists that you call the pilgrims. But, ladies and gentlemen, from the frontier of Tejas, I'm sure you would be very proud to know that that was not the first Thanksgiving. The first Thanksgiving took place in what is today El Paso, Texas in 1598, 23 years before the pilgrims had their celebration. The Spaniards that were there exploring had a Thanksgiving celebration described in detail with the local Indian tribes. So Texas, we're very proud of you. <laughs> However, as a nation, the first official Thanksgiving that was uh, ordained by Congress, if you will, had some very unique and uh, desperate strugglings. You may have never heard of the Battle of Miller's Glen. That's because the Battle of Miller's Glen was not fought with gunpowder and sword. It took place in the heart of one general that stands before you today. You see, in the winter of 1777, uh, I had just written a general order that was to celebrate the success that we had at uh, Saratoga. We had defeated the British at Saratoga. And Congress had written to me and said, let's give a day of thanksgiving and praise for that great victory. And so I wrote it out on December the 5th. What I didn't know is that General Howe was surrounding my army on the 4th. And we engaged them that very day, and we fought the Battle of White Marsh on the 5th and 6th and 7th and 8th of December. And then we were beat upon pretty bad. We were short on supply, and it was getting very cold. And fortunately, European style of warfare, you go to winter quarters for the cold months. And so we attempted to disengage and go back to Valley Forge. But on the way, the British, sensing victory was very close and they were going to capture the gray fox, they pursued us. And we were coming up on the Delaware River and, and I did not want to get trapped against that river. And so we stopped six miles from the river at a place called Miller's Glen. It was a high defensible position and I thought my 11,000 men could possibly <coughs> sustain themselves if we had to engage the British again. Before nightfall, we were surrounded on three sides by the British. Sensing victory, they had not disengaged. They had not gone to winter quarters yet. They thought we can end this right here. Surrounded by British, backed up to the Delaware River, we sat December the 14th and the 15th 
And there I sit with that order, contemplating what should we do. My generals were telling me that we should dis disband the army, tell the men to get out as best they could. Maybe we could infiltrate the, the enemy lines and they could sneak out. Of course, it would be the end of my life, probably. If the American cause was over, then I was a traitor and would be hung for treason. As I d debated what to do, it was my habit to pray and meditate two hours a day. In desperation, have you ever taken God's Word and done one of these? That day I did, and it's reported that of all the places, it fell on Psalms 1 and 36. Could I share with you what that says? That's actually called the Psalm of Psalms. How could I ask my army to give a day of thanksgiving and praise when I had not fed them? What was now on, going on three days. Nothing. Now, let me back up just a moment. My commitment to them, if you signed up to be my soldier, your ration would be one small apple, four ounces of apple cider, and four ounces of salted meat. This is not road tar, it is actually meat. That's salted meat. That was not your morning ration or your noon ration or your evening ration. That was your daily ration. That's what we committed to our soldiers. And yet that day I could not even provide them that. They were literally starving to death. They were beginning to get weak. So on the 16th, I got up and read my general order imploring the men to give a day of thanksgiving and praise to God for the success we had, him knowing the situation we were in that day. And so I told them, at noon tomorrow, on the 18th of December, we're going to offer thanksgiving and praise. I didn't know if my army would mutiny. What, what would happen? The reason I did that is because I'd read these words. Oh, how could I give that command? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endures forever. So I knew what I must do. Assembled the men on the 16th of De 17th of December. I gave that order. And as it was being read, and I was standing before my army, 11,000 men, all of a sudden we began to hear a clatter. And it became deafening, and I, I stopped watching my officer who was booming out my general order and looked at the men, and it was almost like a domino effect. The sound that I was hearing was 11,000 sabers hitting the ground. They didn't wait till the 18th. They began to hit the ground immediately. 11,000 men, they played, prayed for three hours and quietly they just began to dissipate as they were finished. Within an hour, the British had become fearful. Desperately, reconnaissance teams were trying to probe the lines and find a way in with the supplies. We had plenty of supplies they couldn't get through the British lines. All of a sudden, the British became fearful. They thought an advancing army from the north was coming and they were going to get decimated. They said, let's get out of here. And they withdrew to winter quarters. Within an hour of my men beginning to pray, supply wagons began to show up with more food than they could eat. Now the interesting thing of that day, we didn't find out for another 45 days the miracle of that day. At the very exact moment that my men were praying, the authorities in France for some reason, had decided to recognize America's sovereignty. And they offered their aid and their navy, which gave you the freedoms that you have. That's the power of prayer. The Battle of Miller's Glen, see, it wasn't on my abilities or my authority. It was a higher authority that gave you those freedoms. Sons and daughters, remember that. Remember that. What must we do? Change the name of that next generation. I was fascinated with sailing. I'll leave you with a poem that my mother taught me. 
At 16, I wanted to join the British Navy. My mother discovered my secret plans and thwarted them. I knew she had ruined my life. <laughs> but as I look back, she was very wise. She understood things that as a 16-year-old, I did not. If I had joined the Navy, you probably would have never heard of George Washington. She saved my life. But I was always fascinated with ships. Did you know that you can sail a ship against the wind? And that's what many of you have done. Let me share a poem. This is how we will turn this nation. One ship goes east, another west, by the self-same winds that blow. Tis the set of the sail and not the gale that determines the way we go. The waves of the sea are as the passing of time as we voyage along through life. Tis the set of the soul that determines the goal and not the calm or the strife. Americans, we are in a storm. There's a battle for the soul of this nation. How will you set your sail? What course will you set your ship, your family? May God bless you, and may God bless America. Thank you so much. Absolutely, yes. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> the authority here. Uh, yes, we've all admired your, your great wisdom and the decisions that you've made. I do understand that uh, during the course of your career, and a very illustrious one at that, um, I'm humbled. The, correct. The uh, uh, certain people in a power uh, condition or, or status came to you and wanted to make you king. I wonder if you recall that, I'm sure, encounter oh. that really put the pressure to you. Do you recall that? Oh, those, those memories are seared into my... I just can't imagine that after fighting for eight and a half years to get out from under tyranny right. that they would even consider right. well, making someone king. Right. Well, it's been rumored down through the, uh, I guess, the ages almost that, you know, you decided not to, of course, based on, based on your real inner uh, knowledge and, and desire for this great country. But it was also rumored that the reason you, one of the reasons that you decided not to except that kingship was that you just could not sanction another king named George. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. Something along those lines that you may not know about me is that I actually lived in Texas as a young man. Did you, did you know that? Our family moved to an area just north of Amarillo. And uh, while we were there, uh, I chopped down my father's favorite pecan tree. <laughs> and uh, he came and said, what happened to my pecan tree? And I said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down your pecan tree. And he said, Mary, pack the bags, load the wagon, we're moving to Virginia. And she said, I don't understand, Lawrence, why? I said, that boy won't lie, he'll never make it in Texas. <laughs> Just, that's, that's the truth. That's just the truth. That's the truth. Any other questions? Can I ask one more? Yes, sir. You know, uh, not an associate of yours, but one that history has brought you together in, uh, in, uh, in well, Lexington, Virginia, for one place, where the uh, university is named after both of you, Washington and Lee University. Well, General Lee, of course, is known by everyone in this room. Uh, he preceded you, of course. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, he was after you. And, but he had a famous horse named Traveler. I wonder, did, did you give a name to your horse? I, I had two favorite horses throughout the war. Uh, Nelson, named after General Nelson, one of my favorite generals, and Blueskin, who was a large, I, I, I'll tell you a, a fun thing I do with ch ch school children is I'll ask them, I've got a question for you. What color was George Washington's white horse? <laughs> Hands go up, and of course they say white. He was a dapple gray. That's right. If a horse has any coloring, he's not considered a white, he's considered a gray. So my blue skin, of course called him blue skin because if you got him wet, he had blue splotches on his, on his skin, but they were both steady under fire like no horses I've ever had. So. You mean a quarter horse? 
Uh, no, he would not have been a quarter horse at that time. We did, did not know what a quarter horse was. <laughs> Any other questions? Did they get hurt during <clears throat> combat at all? Yeah, you know, a few, a few nicks, but uh, yeah, Blue Skin I think was wounded twice that we know of. But uh, other than that, now as a young man in the uh, French and Indian War at Monongahela, I had two horses shot out from under me in one day. Oops. So yeah, very, very dangerous day. And of course, when it's recorded that as I went back to my quarters and took off my coat, discovered that four bullets had passed through my jacket and yet I was untouched. Ooh. Very good question, my lady. Any other questions? Thank you. I think it was so enlightening. Thank you. Thank you.